that kind of works. In camera effects. Wah. Hey everyone, Shannon here. I'm actually really impressed with myself. <laughs> Here to share a review about The Hobbit: An Unexpected Journey, and I know that most people have probably who have been who are interested in the film have probably already seen the film, and if they have a YouTube channel, they probably already reviewed the film. So actually, I'll have to now go back and uh, watch people's reviews because I tend to stay very spoiler free um, and don't read reviews until I not only see but review the film myself because I want to ensure that it's from my own opinion kind of thing. Anyway, back to the, this is my third time trying to record this, so I'm <laughs> my brain is already st starting to think about other things other than doing this review. <laughs> anyway, so I was really excited to see this. I ended up seeing it just last week. I went with my sister and her husband, and we saw it in IMAX and in 3D. Um, I'll talk about the IMAX 3D experience after, um, but uh, first up, I was one, uh, you know, I think this is one of those movies that if you're a fan of fantasy, you're just going to see it, right? Like, really? You know, whether or not you've read the book or not. And I actually have. I read the book and I chose it for last year's Book to Film Club, the 2012 Book to Film Club, which I'm not doing this year, but I did, I did actually put up a list of book to film adaptations I'm planning on reading. And I finished my first one this week. Anyway, back to the Hobbit. So, I read this, and I read it in terms of the sense that I did read each and every word on each and every page, but I'm not sure I understood any of it. Like, I just, I don't know, for some reason it's just, it's so dense, and there's so many characters, especially the dwarves, that I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. Like, just no clue. So, I, I did review it. I actually should go back and read my book review and see if it's anywhere near this. But, you know, it, and I had similar feelings about Lord of the Rings when I read them. I just didn't super connect to the, the books, but I loved the films. And it's one of those odd instances in terms of book to film. I almost always like the book better. But with these ones, I love the movies. I love them. And I love the fact that the people involved in making them know, understand, and love the story so much that they can share it in such a big, expansive, epic way. And um, because I d that's not the experience I get from reading the book. I read lots of fantasy. I've always read lots of fantasy um, and big epic stories. And, you know, I have. I just, but for some reason with these books, I just don't, I just, it doesn't connect. But when I see the films, I'm like, you know, just like totally pulled in by the world and just like, wow, yeah. So, and I actually got really pulled in even before seeing the film. The first time I saw the trailer, which I think was back in 2012, maybe even seeing Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance, or something like that. And they showed the trailer, and it was the one that starts with the song. And, the, uh, you know, from the first line, I was like, just, like... <laughs> you know, like, I was, like, inching closer, like, I'm like, I, you know, so I was won over very easily, and I didn't even watch the first, the rest of the trailer, I was just, you know, did, did this in, the, in my seat, um, but, yeah, but, you know, now I actually want to go back and watch it, so, I got one over very quickly in terms of that, and I love the world, and it's weird, because when I was watching it, I feel like, you know, my intellectual brain, you know, is, is, was very on, and I was really feeling like, oh, this is really geared towards the fans, this is really blah, 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 you know, it's very fan-centric, and not that, and I think there's often, anything that has a sort of big enough following, there sort of becomes this weird divide of, you know, this is like, you know, pandering, you know, and then if you're a fan, you're just like, yeah, you know, so it's, li but it's like, who cares? I mean, you know, <laughs> like, in some ways, I'm just like, I don't, you know, I don't think it was, you know, why shouldn't it be for the fans? Like, for me, I was very happy to return to Middle Earth and to enjoy time there, and, you know, that's fine. So once I turned sort of the intellectual brain off, it you know, I got a little more settled into the movie, and then it took me a little while to settle in a little bit 
more because I was still kind of like overwhelmed by like the, there's so many characters and it's hard to tell people apart even though they give you lots of cues like in terms of the costuming if you ever have trouble with that like just note people's like um, like hair color or something about them and this one with almost all the dwarves there's something very unique about each one of the dwarves that you can you know hold on to whether it's their hair or their hat or their clothes or their their accent or something like that and so you know it, it I did not get it all on the first time but you know there was enough to differentiate a little bit you know a little bit um, so that was you know but the dwarves are really entertaining <laughs> like they're really entertaining but what took me a little long like and, and the guy who plays Bilbo is really really good um, Martin Freeman just wow really really good and that's and what a challenge for him because you know in the Lord of the Rings films the character is played by Ian Holm who's a phenomenal actor and uh, Martin Freeman's you know a good actor I'm not saying he isn't it's just like you know that's a lot to live up to and and he really does but I feel like there was a bit of a I didn't think about this before whether I feel like it's the same character the same person the same personality I think it does I just I didn't even I didn't even think about it it was just like he's Bilbo like, like without a doubt, I was just like, it's Bilbo. You know, he was so embodied the character. So that was pretty awesome. But what really got me settled into the film is when I started, again, turn the intellectual brain off, and I started just sort of, like, thinking and experiencing it as stories. Um, and I know that sounds a little weird to say, because, like, every film, with the exception of some sort of, like, art house films or whatever, um, and maybe some documentaries, every film does have a story, but this one's really about story and it's about storytelling in a way so there's a more there's almost a meta level I know I said I turned the intellectual brain off eh? but I can't help it but <laughs> there's like a, a meta level within the film on that where it's sort of not only sharing stories but about storytelling as well but when I thought of it as listening to stories and seeing stories and experiencing stories then I just uh, then I was just totally just tucked in you know I just felt like I was in front of a campfire you know except for that I don't I'm not an outdoor girl <laughs> so like you know <laughs> I don't know like it's just so just receiving the stories and there's some really great stories in this movie and I'm so happy because I just did not get them from the book I don't know how much because I just like my retention wasn't very good so I don't know how much is and isn't in the book there's definitely stuff that is for sure but um so I don't know how much they expanded on that or not so I don't know but for me that was where I just really relaxed into it and started to just enjoy each and every moment. I had no idea, no concept of the passage of time while I was watching it. You know, I know it was a really long movie. It didn't feel like it at all. It just, you know, just, I was just like, ooh, what's going to happen here? And ooh, what's going on there? And ooh, like, you know, it's just like, what's going to happen next? Or ooh, does this explain that? Like, I just really was engaged on so many levels. Um, and, you know, to top that all off, there's some really great actors in this movie, like Martin Freeman as Bilbo, Ian McKellen, of course, as Gandalf. Um, but for me, Ken Slott, who plays Balin, the sort of old, older, wise dwarf. Oh, Actually, I don't even know if I'd say wise. He was, like, I just said that because he's older. His character's older. There was something... I, I guess he is. He's sort of, like, of the old the old guard, kind of, you know, the older generation, but be, but, uh, you know, there's, I don't, whatever it is, it was just, he was amazing, just amazing in this film, and I actually really loved how much, um, the dwarves looked different and unique from each other, mostly from each other, some of them looked the same, but the same on purpose kind of thing, um, and so he was really easy to spot when he was on, I felt Richard Armitage, who plays Thorin, who's, amazing like he he but I did feel like he felt a little he looked a little less dwarfy <laughs> but I think that was 
intentional. And it's so funny because with his character, I kept on feeling like I wanted to see like a little more, a little different, or a little variation. And then I just, and I was wondering, well, maybe that's maybe that's on purpose, you know? Like, I, I wonder if we'll find out why he's like that. Like, it was just engaging on that kind of level. And that's one of the wonderful things about having an ensemble cast, is that you have those levels. Like, you have all these dwarves, and it's like on first watch, you can't you can't take it all in. And I love re-watching things. I love it. Um, so for me, I just know that over time, I'll, under, like, I'll be able to pick out, you know, each of the different dwarves in each of the scenes, like whether, you know, how, how much it's about them or not, and how much you'll see of them, you know, see their characters earlier, you know, and all those kinds of things. I remember, I know I felt that way very much about the um, 2004 version of King Arthur with Clive Owen and even Gruffold and Mads Mikkelsen and Ray Winstone and Ray Stevenson and uh, <laughs> Hugh Dancy uh, and um, I always forget his name. The Australian guy that plays Gawain Oh, he's amazing. And he's in a lot, too. He was in Zero Dark Thirty. So, he's just amazing. Anyway, so, but, like, so I look forward to that, having that sort of expanded experience of, of seeing it and seeing the depth of that. And they do give you cues. If you have a hard time picking out, they usually, you know, they give you cues in terms of, you know, hair color, or accents, or, you know, something they wear, or something they do. There usually is something, you know, that you can latch on to if you're having trouble, um, or repetition always works for me as well. <laughs> so overall, like, highly rewatchable, no sense of time, enjoyed it immensely, and I'm actually totally, totally fine with the fact that there's going to be three films, even though I'm sure they could have probably very easily made this one film. I'm like, honestly, to be in this world longer and more, I have no problems with that. <laughs> I have no problems with that whatsoever because I enjoyed so much of this film. So, and I guess the last thing I was going to mention, I was going to talk about the IMAX experience, and um, it was, uh, so I saw it in 3D, and uh, it was really quiet, which was kind of cool because it was, you know, it was two months after the release, so that was nice. Um, but uh, the 3D, like, I don't, I don't actually see uh, 3D films in 3D. I just see either flat or sometimes in this case I saw there's a little doubling going on, um, but only we usually with lettering or if there's a light background or if there's a very large figure. Um, but it's not, I'm used to it. Like I just, you know, there's, I always try and see stuff in 2D, but with a film like this, often I'm like, I want to hear it in a really, I want to see it in a big theater and I want to see it somewhere with great sound. So I'll see, watch, I'll pay extra for the 3D even though I can't see it. <laughs> It's also about the experience of it, right? Like, it's not just, you know, I don't know. So, anyway, that's, I guess that's not really, you know, <laughs> that exciting to hear about. <laughs> but um, it was so much fun to see, and I was so happy I finally did get to see it with my sister and her husband, because we had planned to go all together, and it had taken a lot of scheduling and rescheduling, and, and, uh, and we finally ended up getting to see it, and then it just ended up being perfect. I enjoyed it so much. I can't wait to see it again. And I'm sure if I redid my film list from 2012, it would be on my best of list, without a doubt, along with Les Miserables, which I saw uh, in 2013 as well. So awesome. The Hobbit, The Unexpected Journey. I hope this uploads. This is my third recording of this. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Ooh, center, center. Where's the center?